Good evening again, everyone. This is Melissa Raspberry from the American Institutes for Research. We have the distinct honor and pleasure of being the managers of the CS10K community and those that are responsible for organizing tonight's awesome webinar for you. Um, I am very glad to have both Gail Chapman and Leslie Aronson, as well as a couple of LAUSD um, students here with us tonight. And they're going to be exploring the topic of um, exploring the social good of computing. So um, as I said, my name is Melissa. I will be watching the chat window. We do encourage you, um, if you have any questions, you're welcome to contribute them there in the chat window. But we also hope that you will call in on our conference line um, number and um, join us um, both orally to be able to ask your questions aloud as well. I do just ask if you do call in to please mute your line. Um, you can either do so directly on your phone or if you call in um, on the top toolbar of your screen, there's a little phone icon at the top and a drop down um, menu that says mute my phone or um, disconnect. So you just want to mute your phone and, and then unmute when you're ready to talk. So we are recording this for those who cannot be with us live tonight, and we'll be sharing the recording and the presentation later. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Gail, um, and I'll be with you in the chat box if you need anything. Thanks so much. OK, great. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, we uh, have an exciting evening this evening. I am really um, pleased to be able to have Leslie Aronson, who is a um, ECF teacher in LA Unified School District. And I'm going to let her speak a little bit more about her own experiences. And um, she has brought with her two of her students that she will also introduce. Um, and um, we hope that this particular web webinar will be a launch for a series that will allow us to take an in-depth look into how we can integrate computing and social good into one classroom, which is a very natural fit for exploring computer science. And I know many of you are already doing projects that include uh, things that are local to your community and have tried to do uh, things that will create a positive atmosphere between the community and the classroom. So we will explore that tonight. And then hopefully others of you will have ideas that you'd like to contribute and that we can build future webinars from. So the agenda as, that I have displayed who is in the room. We've already got folks having uh, indicated who they are in the chat window. I hope, as uh, Melissa said, that you will continue to add comments there, but also please do call in when you have an opportunity. Um, and then how we use ECS to connect students to real world issues, some student stories related to that, some logistical ideas on how to create projects and the kinds of scopes that they uh, might in, might take on, skills and takeaways, and wrap up the next steps. So our guests are Leslie, as I mentioned before, and her two students. And so without further ado, I will turn it over to Leslie, and she will take it from here. Thank you. Um, so I'm Leslie Aronson. I teach at Poche Tech Academy. We are located in South Los Angeles. And I am here with two of my seniors, Annika and Sydney. And we've been together. This is our third year together. So I feel like just a little um, background. We are a K-12 school at Poche. And after ninth grade, every high school student needs to choose an academy, either technology, health, or finance. So if you choose technology, then I am your academy teacher for three years straight. And our first class is Exploring Computer Science. So the project we're focusing on today was sort of our big hour of code tech fair. But it is also something that can be incorporated into Exploring Computer Science. Um, my students can attest to it. Every single thing that we do in my class I ha has to relate to something that they can put on their resume, something that they can connect to the real world. It has to have more value than just a grade for me. 
So, um, and we've been working on that for three years. In 10th grade, we work on our resumes when we finish our HTML unit in ECS. We add that to our resumes when we finish Scratch. We add that. We build digital portfolios and we write reflections about the work that we do. Um, so here, so, so this project, Computing for Social Good, I've been thinking about it a lot, about, you know, my students are with me even for one year, for two years, for three years, what is the takeaway? It has to be larger than an A for my class. It has to have something of value and meaning to them that they can use to gain confidence, to gain experience, and to use to get the scholarships, the internships, the jobs that they need. Um, so everything that we do, we build our scratch projects. They have to, I think, Sydney, what was your scratch project about autism? And do you know what yours was about? Uh, biology? OK, so they, um, when we do like our final scratch project, it also has to have something of value, not just, oh, I like. Um, Adele, she's really cool, so I'm going to do a stress project about Adele. It needs to sort of have some kind of um, value that either connects to another class or to the outside world. Um, and they get to choose their topics. I give them parameters. I give them a lot of guidance and encouragement. <laughs> Sydney will talk more about that. Um, and they know that what we're doing is we're building up our experience. Not everything is fun and not everything is easy. But over the scope, we build our communication skills and our confidence, which to me is what you actually do need for computer science. It's one thing to code. It's another thing to get the job and work with the team and create a bigger project. Agreed? OK. Um, so the project we're talking about is we did a big out of code tech fair. You know, my students have now been with me for two years. They've gotten programming skills, they've gotten certified in JavaScript, they know how to do HTML, they've created digital portfolios. It's now time to sort of let go a little bit and see what they can do. Um, so we create teams, which is sort of the most chaotic part of the project, is to identify one, an issue that um, they can address they have to use technology to address or solve an issue in the community. And we define community, um, the easiest community to define is our school. That's sort of the easiest target audience. But it could be our parents. It could be in the um, world around us. A, com a topic that we've done in the past was health and food and um, the food deserts that we experience here in Los South Los Angeles. You know, there's Trader Joe's and Whole Foods all over the place, but there's not any in a five-mile radius from around here, although I think one is about to open. Um, so the beginning is just a lot, a lot of brainstorming to figure out who are our leaders, who are our programmers, who are the art directors, the writers, the technologists who help document the story, um, and then what is the issue we can all gather around. And it sort of happens together. We're deciding on our issues at the same time as we're deciding on our jobs. Um, so we started off this semester with a huge brainstorm. I had kids get into groups based on what job they thought they might have, not the job they actually got, but the job they sort of wanted. And we did a huge brainstorm. We shared it out and shared it out. Um, and Sydney, do you want to talk about what your topic was and how you came up with it? Um, so my group's topic, oh, I'm the account executive of my group called Aquaforce, and our group's topic is um, based on water conservation and water scarcity. And water scarcity. And so how we came up with our ideas, I was put into a group, and she gave us two minutes to come up with um, a few ideas <laughs> to and present them. And so I was like two minutes. minutes. You think it was really two minutes? It was. <laughs> and so I was kind of thirsty, and I was looking at a bottle of water. <laughs> and I thought about how um, California is in a drought. And so I said, oh, why don't we do one on water conservation? Because not a lot of people know about it. And we are taking water for granted. And our world could vary up in like a barren wasteland if we don't, um, if we aren't conscientious about um, preserving our water. And um, so, so I think you pitched that. Yeah. We, um, we took notes of all the ideas that the students pitched. 
and we put them all into a survey to see who actually was interested in working on a project with that topic. And that's how we finally narrowed it down to our, um, unfortunately, 10 ideas, because this class is 50 students. I don't recommend that. Hopefully, your classes are much, much smaller than that. Um, but due to logistics issues, we had to put all my seniors in one period, which made planning and executing one event easier, but classroom management for 50 students, I'm sure you can imagine, is um, challenge. So we came up with our 10 jobs and I had, or our 10 um, topics, and I had students also with the survey list their top three choices and also what two jobs they wanted. In the past, we've done like round robin interviews where the class identified who they thought was best at which job and we figured it out that way. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. We also once had, every student had to come up with an idea and they pitched it to a team of judges we had like software developers and chief technical officers. Um, but I found that they took away a little bit more control than I wanted because some of the topics that they loved were not as realistic um, in terms of execution. I think what outside people don't recognize is while some topics are amazing, you have your students for X amount of minutes in the day and they have other classes and other commitments. So while it's amazing to make a full-blown video game, most video games are made, you know, in a year with 90 people working over 40 hours a week on it. And you have your students for like five hours a week, <laughs> and you don't have their full attention for all of that time. Um, so I, um, I had the students pick their product, and we tried to make it scalable so that we could create prototypes that were realistic in the times that we had. Um, so once you have your topics, we identified our 10 account executives. Sydney, as she was telling me today, did not volunteer <laughs> to be account executives, but yet she ended up. What happened? Um, I had actually chosen either programmer or a technologist because I feel like I go better with those. But she like called me over and said, I'm going to make you account executive. Thanks. <laughs> What is it done for you? Um, I think it's teaching taught me a lot about leadership and how to make sure your team does their work. Also, make sure you do their work, your work and stay on track. Do you think it help your confidence? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so we get our ten account executives, and we sort of play a little bit of fantasy football. I gave them a list. We do this in private of all the students and their jobs that they sub selected. And we go around and choose our team. So once Annika is selected as art, uh, art director, nobody else can choose her. You know, she, you have to choose a different art director. Or you go next and choose your technologist. Um, but now you have five kids who have decided on a topic. And before they can actually start, they have to start to learn how to work together, um, which is challenging. Because communicating ideas is deceptively complicated. You like assume that everybody's on the same page as you, or you're afraid to voice an opinion because you think somebody else is going to be upset about it. Um, or you're like, well, they're the writer. They'll figure it out. And I'm the art director, and I don't even have to think about that. But they quickly realize in order to have one common topic, one common idea, one common project, you have to get on the same page. And the goal for their topic was to really highlight the issue and create a prototype of how they were going to solve it and document the whole process. Um, so Annika is, Annika's been on her team the longest. Her team started in the summer because it was an internship that led itself into our project. Um, do you want to talk about how it was working with your team? Um, so in the beginning, it was just me and two other team members. Um, and we worked through this throughout the summer. Um, and we kind of really became close with each other, so we came, became very comfortable. And later on, when we started the school year, we added two other students in our class to, our, to join our project. And we didn't really have the same connection that we had with each other with them. So it was kind of just like starting the project all over. Um, we had the information, but we had to sort of regain like everyone's trust. You know, we had to make in 
uh, a comfortable environment for everyone, you know, to be able to voice opinions and to, you know, just brainstorm ideas. So what we did is, you know, we all sat at a table, and it was difficult in the beginning. Like, we didn't really talk much. But after a while, you know, Ms. Erin just sat us down. She put us in a room all together. Like, just us. Like, we were all punished. Um, and we were forced to, like, actually speak about what we wanted to do. And that's how we just jump-started um, like growing together, so um, there's certain people in the group that really enjoy the techn technological side, and some are very artistic, you know, and sitting in that room together, we kind of discovered what everyone's interest was, so that's how we decided which jobs other people should get and who should do what, and that kind of made us more comfortable, and by doing that and sitting in the room and talking through everything, you know, um, it just sort of made us more open with each other, and I feel like we've really gotten far from, like, where we used to be. Like, now everyone has, like, different ideas, and they're great ideas. You know, even if it's, like, not such a great idea, we kind of add on to it to improve it, but we've actually, like, grown as a team. Yeah. I think that's one of the most important aspects to me. You know, I believe in the rigor and the coding and the programming of computer science, but I talk to companies on a regular basis because I'm constantly checking in to see what they want in the people that they hire and what I'm doing in my classroom to make my students those kind of people. And I've met with countless PTOs who say we're looking for people who are willing to try. We are looking for people who communicate. We would rather take a mediocre programmer than an amazing programmer who says he can't or she can't work with other people. Um, and that is the biggest thing that we're breaking down, especially um, in the community that I work with, where 87% Hispanic, 13% black, we're like 84% first generation to go to college. And there is a quiet pride of my students, which doesn't lend to open questioning and communication. There's like barriers and walls that need to be broken down, and that's one of the biggest um, gains from this type of project. It's challenging. It takes time. Um, but And you don't always see it in the day-to-day -day of like, yes, this is what they did today. Um, but after they present it, they all walk taller. They all smile more confidently. They are all more self-assured. Um, and they all have more things to put on their resume. <laughs> Winner all around. Um, so this is six steps to planning. Here's the biggest challenge. You tell students they're going to do a project. They have to solve or address a problem in their community using technology. And they get so focused on the what. And they try to tell people what they're doing, but they enter you in the middle of the conversation. And we've learned from experience that people respond to the feel, the why. Um, so Onyx's project is Side with Peace, which is focused on domestic violence. And she came up with that idea because everybody in the group had first-hand experience, right. um, the family members who had experienced domestic violence. Mm -hmm. um, but nobody was talking about it. People were just quietly suffering. Um, and it really gives you the feel. But you also can't walk people into the middle of the idea. So um, we, went, we met with this artist who broke down six steps to planning because when students think about the what, they often forget about the why and the how. What is your intent? Why are you doing this? Um, what information do you need? Under what context? Who is your audience? Nobody is in your head, which is why working in a group is so challenging. Because um, nobody's in your head, let alone your audience. Like Even if you get on the same page as your whole group, you have to then gain the perspective of your audience. What do they know? Where is they coming from? How are they going to step in? Um, and then the production, what are the really, like, we all have these big ideas, but to getting them to sit down and actually execute the big idea um, is challenging. Um, Sydney can talk, she did a game, right? And it, the idea was a huge, yeah. complicated game. Um, our, idea, our first idea was very huge, like we were scaling it way big. And Ms. Anthony kept telling us to, like, scale it down. You have to be more realistic, but at first we didn't listen. Um, we kept trying to think big, but eventually we got it to the right size. It's good. 
right? You had like multiple worlds. Yeah. And, <laughs> but I mean, I'm like, if you haven't even made one world yet, how do you think you're making ten worlds? Like maybe it's a one world game and we can then add another world. But when you start with a ten world game, it's, you're not you're not going to make it in time. <laughs> um, so then we had a pitch day. I needed my students to really gauge where their idea is and how audiences react. And so very quickly, I think it was two weeks after they got their topic, they had to pitch their idea and what how they were going to execute it to a team of judges. We had game designers there. We had chief technical officers there. We had sponsors from a nonprofit. I, um, if you ever are interested, if you give me your email, I'll add you to my list and I send out like monthly emails about like, here's what we're up to and here's volunteer opportunities and here's how you can help out. And so we got eight people there and the students were nervous. <laughs> and um, I don't know about your students, but my students always, we got this. <laughs> yeah, we got <laughs> this. <laughs> and they don't practice. So, um, and I have learned, I hate seeing a final project when people go, oh, if only I had done this, if only I had done that. I'm like, no. When we do this for real, it's going to be awesome. There's not going to be if only I had thought of this. So our pitch day is our first attempt at trying to figure this out. And, um, and our judges, some were super kind and some were not super kind. <laughs> but I think they also need to experience feedback. You're not like, oh, you're so cute, and look at you try. Like, no, this, you didn't explain your idea. I don't understand what you're saying. This isn't going to happen, or what are you thinking about? Um, one of the biggest challenges we found is there's execution and there's promotion. So I have split it up, where the first part of the project, they execute, and then they work on promoting it, because they do it at the same time is sort of challenging. Um, okay. All right. Cool. Any questions so far? Thoughts? Comments? All right. Ah, oh, somebody is typing. In the meantime, I'm giving you the next slide. <laughs> um, yes, I don't recommend the classroom at 58. Neither do Sydney or uh, Onyx. <laughs> <No. laughs> um, currently, it is 90 degrees in Los Angeles, and our air conditioning broke, so it's super fun. <laughs> um, but we can so feel bigger at 50. Yeah, so let's take a couple minutes to give people a chance to type and just ponder what you've done so far. Um, think about things that, that Leslie has said that you can imagine um, being challenges for your classroom or um, ideas that you have that have similar kinds of issues related to them that we might be able to chat about before we go on to um, more specifics about how this fits into ECS, et cetera. Yeah. I think you can. Um, it's funny that you say it sounds like technovation, because that is where I got my inspiration. <laughs> um, but I couldn't do it for just one group when I thought it was such a great project. So I um, definitely took a lot of where they were coming from. I think we were already on that same page, and I was doing a similar project with seniors. Um, but I use like the technovation surveys and marketing stuff to help them get started with their research. Um, also, when you have a classroom full of students who are also boys, you can't do straight up technovation. 
We did it here. We had two groups that did technization. Uh, so here's, here's a really important question from Vic. Um, and I think that hopefully we'll get into this more when you get into the part where there's a connection to ECF. But um, he's asking about whether or not you worry about students not receiving the rigorous exposures to programming and logic development if we're also focusing on roles and teams. Um. So this question is good. I think that you need to keep in mind that my students, when we do this project, we've actually completed the ECS course and a whole year of game design and programming. So we've done that. I, I've, I, I've talked to my students before. I'm like, we could do this, or we could you know, learn a whole other programming language. But every time we do this, the benefits totally outweigh um, but just straight up programming because you do have to learn how to communicate and you do learn how, have to learn how to be part of a team. And more and more of the CTOs that I speak to are like, we have our own language. We have our own way of doing everything. Anybody that we hire has to get trained with our style. Um, and in order to work in that kind of environment, you have to learn how to communicate and um, talk to other people. So that is always going to be the pushback. You know, the could my students be programming longer, harder? Yes. Um, but in the end, they're getting themselves exposed and in front of people. And my quiet programmers have not been getting the jobs. It's been my loud account executives who have been getting the job offers every time. Um, okay, did I miss any questions here? Yeah, it looks like there's a lot of questions that are um, very much related to the amount of time your students have spent in computer science already. So perhaps we should start making some connections here um, so that folks can see how they might fit this in, even though their students don't have all of this prior knowledge coming in. Since that's one of the big themes of exploring computer science. So we've got, we've got people on the phone that are both CS principals teachers and ECS teachers. And then I guess we also have some others that are neither one or both. So. Um, so I think it would be good for us to start making some of those connections as well. Um, I really like what Brittany said, that Google is your friend. I just read an article about the truth about coding. You know, you like Google and ask everything. You know, you nobody codes from scratch anymore. It's go find your resources and make it work for you. Um, uh, to record the picture they can OK, and then Nicole asked, do I allow them to record their pitches so they can still participate but not feel intimidated? No. No, that we practice. We practice our pitches in front of people. Um, and we've done mock, in 10th grade, they do mock interviews. I make them talk to people from the start. It is nerve wracking. I am also a shaker. They've seen me shake. You know, I, my heart was pounding before this webinar started. I get nervous, too. Um, but that doesn't do you any favor, in my opinion. Like, we are all, it's OK to be shy. Not everybody needs to be as loud as I have now made myself to be. But we have to learn how to get our ideas across. Um, in the pictures and the teams, not everybody has to speak as much. It doesn't need to be fair and equal. Um, Sydney's group has this amazing artist on their team who did much of the graphics for their presentation. Um, so he did not necessarily have to speak as much. Um, but you know, I was thinking about if, if we did a project like this, and I do smaller projects in ECS that then leads to this. Um, for example, with unit one, when you're really talking about 
human-computer interaction. You know, we do a lot with ethics and technology. We do, um, you know, that Web 2.0 where we teach each other different websites that are out there. Those are what? Computer science. Yeah, Sydney won an award for her computer buying project. It got presented at UCLA. Um, we, you know, we really think about what are the issues out there, um, the pros and cons of uh, 3D printers, of uh, driverless cars, of uh, drones. Um, so you can, like, just in terms of, like, doing a project like this, start talking about common issues in the community that they're connected to in Unit 1. Um, you know, problem solving is where I really get them to, in Unit 2, talk to each other, you know, where you sort of, like, give them the chocolate bar problem or the um, binary tower problem. You know, you walk away. You're like, they can talk to each other. Use your resources. Figure it out. Get comfortable so that you can start breaking down the barriers there. Um, and then for Unit 3 with HTML, you can start thinking about what projects you want to do and start researching and building the scope with the web page. Um, and then the prototype could be a scratch prototype from Unit 4. So there's a way to maybe not go as big um, and as hands-off as this project is, but a way to have like a year-long focus to guide the project. Um, OK, did I miss any questions while we were talking? So I think that I think that was really good, Leslie, and I know you're coming back to that in a, a few slides away. But I think it's really important to, to continue to highlight the fact that you know, these skills are skills that you want to build throughout the coursework that you're doing, whether you're doing it or trying to do it in one course or several courses, there is still this opportunity uh, to do projects that are uh, meaningful. They, you just may need to help students um, more with their various collaborative techniques if you're starting scratch, from scratch, so to speak, in exploring computer science. So maybe, as Nicole mentioned, you know, the video in advance um, as an option to use as a way to build presentation skills, even if it's not part of a, a big project like this. So um, let's we can continue, and then we'll come back to some strategies as we um, as we get further in. Okay. So, um, and like what Elaine said with, you know, Unit 1 and Unit 2 lends itself to a lot of presentations. And it's scary, and my students don't like it. Um, but I just today I had a student who, she went on a field trip, and she came over to me. She's like, I talked about you at the field trip. And I said, what did you say? She said, I, I never felt connected to school. My grades were really bad. But you created a community in here. And I feel I belong again. So you know, a lot of kids will opt out of talking because they are scared. And it's really overcoming that. Um, and I know some of the things that I do with my students are very scary. But I am very passionate about making sure that my students know how to achieve when high school is over, that they know how to navigate and find and go after opportunities. And so. In ECS, we pave that way right away. We don't wait. To, even though this is the senior project I'm talking about, all of these things have been worked in many times um, so that we're ready for something like this. But the other thing is, and you'll see here the real world feedback. Like, I am just their teacher, and it is not enough. They sort of need that fear of an audience. They need to experience what an audience sees because um, I think often students feel like their first pass is good enough <laughs> when we all know that's never the job. The job is never a first pass. You have to like keep revising. We have to do the problem solving process and reviewing and revising on a constant basis and making them communicate their idea first for a pitch day to a live audience gets them to really finally settle down and think about execution. And then at the end when we do I mean, for us, we were having this huge tech fair, which was a little scary for me as well, because Code.org got it, and we were supposed to have the mayor here, and all that. But even so, even if it was just students that we were going to have at the tech fair, you know, having a run-through with 
like a class, you know, another class next door or inviting a couple teachers or administrators um, to come in and see and give the feedback. Because what we learned was nobody had enough visuals when they presented their ideas. They had to talk and talk and talk and talk. And if you're just walking up to their table to find out, there's, no, there's nothing for you to see or read and you're coming into the middle of conversation. So they had to rethink how they were delivering their message and their ideas. Um, all right, so I'll pause there for a second. Um, great, and we do. As we try to create a safe environment, we really practice respect and community. I mean, I think we do this project so successfully because of community. I can see when Annika's team isn't communicating, I can spot that and figure out, um, <laughs> like, let's be real and what's happening here. Um, because you'll see that students get mad at each other so easily because they don't share their ideas. And I do think that's a really valuable skill that we need to learn ideally in the safe environment of a classroom before you get fired from jobs because you don't say anything um, or get pissed off at your coworker because you think they think that you think something, you know, that, <laughs> that sounds like high school. <laughs> but it's, I think what happens. Um, okay, so for the tech fair, we had the prototype. That was a hard one. Um, to go to Vic's point of like the rigor and what Sydney was saying about a huge project and scaling, I keep trying to get them to do the wireframe, the like basic outline of here's what it will look like and here's what it will do and make the images before they program. Um, everybody wants to go straight to programming and then they realize how challenging that is. Um, and my husband is a software developer um, and he always always complaining about databases, but you can't just sit down and build a database. You have to write it out and scope it out and design it out and test it. Because once you get to programming, you can program yourself into a corner. And that's bad news. Um, so you have to you know, really plan out your idea. And that is really, it sounds so simple, but my gosh, everybody wants to run to the end. And then they go produce. And, um, you know, my students have practiced game design. We build board games before we program them. And um, what did we use, JavaScript and use App Inventor? We didn't. I've used JavaScript and App Inventor. I don't know what I did with these ones. Um, and sometimes it feels old school and laborious, but that is the process. And you have to learn that part of the process. Um, we had a website where we documented everything. I had the technologists take pictures. and little snippets of video and anything that was sketched out, got taken pictures of to um, put up there. And then for the fair, we had incentives. You can see the wheel. This is my video game group that you're looking at. Their idea was we have all these what they call useless gamers on campus, the people who spend probably their expert 10,000 hours of playing video games but have done nothing to show for it. So they created a video game analysis club, and their idea is to get those useless gamers to write reviews so that they can show their you know, experience. And instead of just playing the games, they stop and analyze the game. So they were doing sort of like Mad Lib um, reviews, where like you would spin the wheel for the genre of the game and some adjectives, and you can write like a little quick review of a video game. And I have to say, our video game companies that we've been working with love the idea. Um, so I mean, I think we've been talking about it. You do need to know a project like this is creating chaos. It is not lockstep. It is not everybody's doing the same thing at the same time. But I think most of you ECS teachers out there know that once you hit the HTML unit and the Scratch unit, and the robotics unit, nobody's in the same page anyways. Um, and you, I think in computer science, you have to embrace that. You have to embrace um, challenging your advanced students and motivating your lower, um, I don't like the word lower, your <laughs> less, the ones who don't pick it up as quickly. Um, 
Because I will tell you this too, when we were doing our HTML and our Scratch, some of my best programmers were not my fastest programmers. It took them a while to catch on. And once they got it, their confidence soared. But if I just rushed them through it, I don't think they would have the same success rate. Um, and I'm talking about some of my National Center for Women in Information Technology aspiration and computing winners. Then me is a national runner-up. Um, so, you know, you have to get comfortable with the chaos in the room. And you have to get comfortable with knowing they're going to learn all their standards and get all the experience, but it not, may not be everybody on the same day at the same time, which is sort of unrealistic, I think, anyways. Um, great. And to Elaine's comment, I once had somebody come into my room, and he's like, your classroom feels like an internet startup company. And I was like, that is the best compliment I think you can give me. You know, that is amazing to see students interacting and working and problem solving and creating something is really sensational. It is not a pretty organized classroom, but it is one filled with energy and enthusiasm, and I, I relish that. Um, do you see students practice their teamwork, project management, communication, problem solving? Love unit two. Um, and then they put it all up on their digital portfolios and resumes. And I need to put up a new video. A student of mine was like Harrison, and he's like my best programmer. He went to MIT over the summer. He created a group called Ardu Friends, and they're using Arduino kits to bring to middle school students to give them early access to electrical engineering. And he wrote about his project and his application for the she, she, oh, she Plus Plus conference where he's getting a free trip to Silicon Valley. Um, and he got selected based on his project, not on the basis of his high gluten coding, but on how he put his ideas into the real world and is making a change in his community. That's cool. <laughs> um, so Elaine just asked, what platform do we use for digital portfolios? What do you guys use? I use Google. I use Google. We've done a lot of research. Um, we started with Google Sites. I haven't checked them out lately, but Wix.com and Weebly.com are both free. As, you know, if you can deal with your site being rgfriend.wix.com, then you're fine. Um, it's wix.com, and Weebly is w-e-e-b-l-y. Dot com, um, and you can make professional looking sites. One of the things that we like, I like better about Weebly is you, for your HTML people out there, you can actually create a digital portfolio that looks professional, but you can go in behind the scenes and actually hand code to really customize it to the way you're doing it. Um, and it, you'll see when you um, go through any of my links, most of them are on my Weebly site. Like where it says, listen to the students. I have students from last year talking about what they gained from the project. Um, and they all have links to their individual website. In fact, Annika and Sydney named their link to their digital portfolios as well. So you can see their amazing work. <laughs> you didn't know I'd do that. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I highly recommend uh, Wix and Weebly. I purchased, I think, for like $60, I now own LeslieArrington.com for two years and host everything. So it looks way better than Google. <laughs> um, OK, so there's where ECS fits in. I went over that. And I think we're coming to the end. What, um, tell me your thoughts. What else is going on? I think it might be good to. Um, Oh, look at that, Vicki. A couple, couple minutes, and then um, let folks ask some questions related to this uh, now that you've gone through your whole project. Do you guys want to say anything? Do you recommend this project? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll be <laughs> there. 
Can you see now after it's done, the value of it? When it's, when it's done, <laughs> it's not crystal clear as you go into it. Well, I like that idea for robotics doing project proposals. They can actually follow through with their vision. Okay, I'm just going to go to the next slide people are writing. Um, but you can see articles about the project. I've linked to all of the student projects so that you can see what they've done. Um, and you can like you know see the whole process in action. <laughs> Thanks, Elaine. I appreciate that. That's cool, Vic. Thank you. I will check that out. I'm curious. How do you this system? Elaine, I will say this, one of the challenges and one of the actual cool things is part-time I work for CS Teaching Tips, and they're looking for teachers to post their syllabus and curriculum so that you know we all don't have to start from scratch, even though I think as a teacher we all naturally want to put our own spin on things. So one of the things that I'm working on in the next month or two is to try to put this into some kind of format where um, the resources are together and the timeline is together so you have more of an idea how to actually execute it on your own. Um, yeah, so that, that's my goal for the next few months is to get these things out of my head and into all, you know, everything's on like little random Google Docs. I'm trying to get it all into one place so that um, you know, people can follow, and you know, I definitely am pretty sure Elaine, I've been to your site and taken some of your stuff. Um, <laughs> how big are the groups for the tech fair or for the chief of students are five? For the tech fair, we had it going on for like an hour and a half, um, and we had. I think the most we had in the room was like 60 people. We did it in our multi-purpose room, um, right? I think it was about we at the height. Yeah, Sean was there. He knows. Maybe 100. But um, I would say to like do the, um, the run through, like one class of 25 or one is probably good to have them walk around. I also, when we did our run through, we at one point only had like six volunteers, so I had a couple groups run through and check out a different group because now they're really paying attention. Um, so there's a lot of ways to do it. Oh, everybody's taking. <laughs> I don't want to hear your idea. Um, the tech fair, this will, they do it in groups of four or five is the right number. Four is per, My group is four. No. Yeah. Signature so is four. In yours, yeah. Um, we did, because we're doing a big 
advertising project this semester, so we're keeping with the same theme. And we took some of the dead weight away. I wasn't going to let another kid go all semester without pulling his weight in his group. I say him, that's so sexist, but it was with four boys. <laughs> they took off their teams and made them be their own team, so that they had to do their own work. Hi, Leslie. This is Melissa. I have a question for Sydney and Annika. I hope I'm not putting them too much on the spot here. Oh, they um, love that. But I was... <laughs> I promise you didn't put me up to it. Um, I, I'm just curious to hear from the two of you, if you had to, you know, if your principal, for example, which hopefully this would not happen, but if your principal were to come in and say, hey, I don't think this is worthwhile anymore, or we don't have time for this, you need to, you know, Ms. Aronson, Aronson needs to restructure the way she's doing things, like what would be your pitch to the principal about why this is so important and how this sort of learning provide something different than, quote, unquote, the regular teaching might? Um, well, personally, I do feel a strong difference between this class and all my other classes. All my other classes feel very academic, whereas this one, I can actually see myself um, using the skills that I learned in this class in the future. You know, um, the previous units before we started this big project play a big part in what we're doing now. Um, you know, all the communication skills that we learned, all of the interviewing skills, you know, and just being able to speak to other people that are not your friends um, really made me feel like, okay, there's a future for me. Like, I'm going to need this. This is very important. And that kind of drew me in closer and made me want to interact more. And also, since our projects are based on community struggles and, you know, trying to help the community, that kind of motivated me more to become more interested in this class because, you know, being able to say, oh, I help my community by doing this is a really big part of, like, building your character and who you are and making you stand out from other people around you. Um, yeah, I agree with Anissa. I think that if our principal were to come here, I would try, I would show her all of the great ideas that we have and how they are making a huge impact because in our other classes, they're mainly based on facts, test scores, and trying to get an A in the class, but this class is just so much more than getting an A. It's about actually um, trying to make a difference and um, better ourselves as, well, as also better our community. I did not hear them to say any of that, and I'm crying a little bit. <laughs> um, also, this class, can I just say, last year we did an internship fair, and Sydney and Annika both got internships as a result. Um, they both used their experience. Annika wrote a whole essay about her experience with pair programming and how not only did she like realize how she learns through communication, but it also solidified her friendship really strongly with somebody else in the class. It's just, you know, it's groundbreaking. And I really, the world is not in these silos. The world is not like write a five-paragraph essay in order to um, you know, jump to the next pay scale. You have to figure out all these ugly, chaotic things of how to work, and that's what we're trying to create in this classroom. Um, and it's been reinforced and reinforced. And Cindy asked, have we tried to do this for the school board meeting? Um, I am trying to hit up LAUSD to hire me so that I can do more of these things on a larger scale. Like, I brought two of my groups to a hackathon because they were the two that signed up. And they won second and third place. And I honestly, one, my students are exceptional, but I think they're exceptional because we've created this community. I don't think my students are, well, I have the smartest students in South Los Angeles. But I have my students. And we are who we are, and we grow our skills from there. Um, I think there's, you have to know who the people are and to think that your classroom needs to be like, here's the rigor, jump and get it. Your kids aren't all that self-motivated or even that confident to even try that. You have to, I always like think of it as you want to set the bar high, but you also have to get behind your kids and sort of like keep you know, whispering in their ear to go forward. <laughs> um, thank you, Elaine. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, yeah, and I do want to just tell you what we do in this classroom is scary. And my students, to this day, are sometimes look at me like, really, Ms. Aronson, really? Um, and then they come back to me and like, oh, right, you were right. <laughs> that was a good thing. Yeah, 
So do other, other people have any questions they would like to ask the students or um, Leslie or each other uh, before we um, start to wrap up for this evening? And I will just say this while people are typing. I am always sometimes amazed because people are always amazed when they do that. Like always. And I just think their expectation is so I don't even know where they where their expectation is. You know, just the fact that students can even create something, we don't really give them that much chance. So to see them talk and to see them communicate versus watching them follow your tests and your rules, it's really eye opening. Like that's how we change bias too. We let our students do something, and we showcase it, and we celebrate what they do, which is a large part of why I write um, an email to business partners all the time. One, I want to make sure I'm doing the right thing, but two, I want them to know my students are rocking it out of the park. And we are a low-income, first-generation community that cannot call an uncle who works at Apple to hit them up for a job. So we have to learn how to communicate our skills and showcase them and go after those opportunities and network on our own. <laughs> we might steal that, Brittany. Coding gives you the power to create. Let me write that down. <laughs> um, yeah, Elaine, like when I do my mock interviews, when my students win awards, I basically, anybody who says hi to me, I ask for their email and I add them to my MailChimp list. Um, and it's gotten us articles written about us and news groups here. And you know, we have a lot of positive stories to celebrate. And nobody knows what goes on in your classroom. And I don't. I tell my students and my colleagues, like, no, I don't do any of this to show off. I do this to celebrate and to be an example so we can all be promoting what our students have accomplished. Um, Leslie, can you clarify so, for Carol the progression that the students, the courses that they've taken? Because she came in a little late and missed that part. OK, sorry. Um, so his LUC and their um, A through G requirements are sort of interesting. But so it's been ECS is our 10th grade course. 11th grade is game design and production. Although next year will be um, computer science principles, that will change. And then this senior year is sort of our capstone course. Um, it was called advertisement and design. We're looking for an A through G course that can really celebrate what we do. Although it could be that it's ECS, DSP, and then AP, DSP. Um, I think you guys can understand why if I have a class of 50, I'm not teaching AP, DS. I just want to say thank you again to Leslie and Annika and Cindy um, for being here and to Gail for organizing. I don't know about you, but I'm definitely leaving um, very inspired and, and very excited for not only being able to um, see this, these good things replicate in other classrooms, but specifically um, I can't wait to see the impact that Leslie and her students have on the world because it definitely sounds like they're on the right course. Um, we can, we're welcome to stick, stick around and ask more questions, um, but I did want to run through a couple of things in terms of next steps. Um, we hope that you'll join us on the CS10K community if you're not already a member. We're going to have the follow-up discussion in the ECS open group, which is facilitated by Nicole, who's also here with us tonight. Um, you're able to go, and again, all this information will be in the um, presentation if you want to access it on the website, and I will um, add that link in just a moment. Um, a couple of events that are coming up, March the 22nd is our next ECS webinar. Um, we're going to have part two of creating an action plan for broadening participation. And then Gail hopes to organize many other webinars in the future around the 2016 ECS program thing, exploring the social good of computing. And those dates will be to be determined. We hope you'll follow us on Twitter at CS10K and with the hashtag CS10K. Um, our next monthly Twitter chat is um, Monday, this coming Monday, February 22nd at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. We have moved back to time an hour because we were up against another um, popular chat. So 
we're gonna, um, this month we're going to be exploring the CS for All initiative and what that means for all of us. So we hope that you'll take part. Um, and again, I'm sure Leslie and her students are welcome to stay around for a couple more minutes if you have any questions. But thanks to all to, who joined us, and we hope you have a good evening. Let me also remind everybody that of a um, webinar that's not listed on here, and that's related to ECS assessment on Thursday evening. Um, the SRI folks will be hosting that webinar, and I believe it's at the same time, um, 7.30 Eastern Time, 4.30 uh, Pacific Time. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs>